Hi everyone, welcome to Felina's Pages to another poetry analysis on the CAE GCSE English Literature 2022 curriculum. Today we're talking about A Leave Taking by Algernon Swinburne. So first we're going to do a brief summary and author biography and then a line by line analysis. The goal is to explain simply and help jog your memory for the exam. Let's go. Algernon Charles Swinburne was born into a wealthy family and he received education at Eton and Oxford but did not receive a degree. His works are filled with beautiful descriptions of the beauty of nature and often contain sexual themes which shocked and or delighted many. He became associated with the idea of art for art's sake after poems and ballads in 1806 which brought him the most fame. Swinburne was quite frail and prone to seizures. He also had a period of excessive drinking which led him to bruising and unconsciousness. In 1879, his friend Walt Dunton interfered and is credited with saving his life. Swinburne is noted for his control over language and bold rhythm. However, it is not only his poetry that brought him fame, but criticism too. He was familiar with a lot of literature and that contributed to his style. A Leave Taking is an emotional poem about a woman who rejects the speaker's love. The speaker describes his efforts to woo her, efforts we find out are in vain, so he urges us to leave her, to let us go together because there is no point anymore. We really feel the poet's loss through the language devices and the words that really show how much the speaker feels this pain of abandonment, how he urges us to let go and that even the bitter world out there is better than this current feeling. This dramatic monologue about love really connects connects us with the speaker and demonstrates how heartless he feels the woman is because she's so impassioned and she does not return the feelings that he feels for her. Take a moment to read the poem while I comment a little bit on the structure. There are six stanzas and each one has seven lines. There is a regular rhyme scheme and the first and the last lines end the same way. They seem to close the couplet which reflects the end of the relationship that never even started. The poem is mostly an iambic pentameter with a few variations. Let us go hence, my song she will not hear. Let us go hence together without fear. Keep silence now for singing time is over and over all old things and old things dear. She loves not you nor me as we all love her yeah though we sang as angels in her ear she would not hear so probably the first thing you might notice is the repetition the literary device called anaphora let us go hence is repeated throughout the entirety of the poem and as i talked about before the first line and the last line end with the same rhyme this reflects the finality and it's almost as if the poet is urging himself on well to be more accurate the speaker because we don't necessarily view the speaker and the poet as the same person he doesn't see the point in continuing to be here because he does not hear his words as a poet his songs she does she will not hear he urges us to go because even though he's telling them to her and she can of course hear them she does not hear them in the more meaningful way as in she does not pay heed to his love he urges us to go together he involves the reader in his rejection without fear as in don't worry she won't change her mind we're free to go he tells us to be silent to be still because there is no room for singing anymore there is no room for happiness and for joy that singing evokes this silence is a desolate silence that falls on us almost like a funeral silence nobody wants to break it because there is no room for the joy since she does not return the love in the sixth line the poet stresses yeah as in yes and follows up with a simile even though we sang as angels she would not hear there's a touch of anger and of arrogance here as he compares himself to the angels and this group of lovers too they put in so much effort they connected with the heavens because they felt this like strong otherworldly love and she ignores his efforts completely like who is she to ignore the voices of angels angels who carry love towards her and the final line of she does not hear is of course a very clipped reiteration almost as if he's saying well all of this yes there's no point but who cares there is no point even in me saying that there is no point she does not hear ultimately the reasons do not matter it is the finality that matters it is the outcome that she does not hear and that she will not love us back that matters and the middle line over is surrounded by fear and dear so two words that rhyme and it almost seems to keep them away from each other so here it is the speaker and his love and she is keeping him away from his goal love even though she is his love and even with this whole rejected melancholy and melodramatic tone of yes that's it this is acceptance let us go she does not hear us he relates himself to the others to this group of lovers or perhaps to himself and his useful self you can view it in any way you see fit here he 
almost is trying to reassure himself still and through this lens it seems like this whole poem is an ultimate like final shots to try and get her back it's almost as if he's saying to a group of people let's go she does not hear me while she's there to try and get her to feel guilty or to get her to feel pity anything and if this is the case this could be a case of apostrophe the literary device i talked about previously meaning that this is addressed to someone who isn't really present she while is present she's also not present and this is the juxtaposition that is prominence throughout the entire poem. There are many oppositions and we'll get to all of them later. And the sounds in the silence are oh, the sounds in the silence. The sounds in the stanza are also very important. So we have the sibilance of silence, singing, sang. All the softness seems like a whisper, like he's hoping that he's like persuading her, but he, it's a tentative chance. And there's also the repetition of the vowel sounds and over all old things. They stretch the time out, this assonance. It's as if he delays leaving. Notice the notice how he repeatedly says let us go but he does not move this reminds me a little bit of waiting for Godot as in we're going and then they do not move let us rise up and part she will not know let us go seaward as the great winds go full of blown sand and foam what help is here there is no help for all these things are so and all the world is bitter as a tear and how these things are though ye strove to show she would not know the second stanza seems to be building up his spirit again that self confidence almost as if he's saying let's rise up because we're those angels from the previous stanzas we're too good for her he's building his con he's building his confidence he's trying to rebuild his ego after this dejection but ultimately it's still there that she does not care oh that right <laughs> he's trying to say that she does not mind because they are nothing to her they are exactly like that wind because she does not really feel them they are around her she hears their voices but they are ultimately like intangible to her she does not feel anything for their efforts there's also hyperbole here in the great winds and fall and maybe the winds are great i don't know but it seems to be as if he's bringing it very much to the brim in order to elicit a response he's purposefully exaggerating it and he really wants her sympathy this is all to elicit her ultimate response he wants her to know that this world is bitter he wants her to feel for him him. He, he wants her to know that his tears are not just salty, his tears are bitter because he feels the pain that she has caused him so much that even his body is completely disrupted. It's not a salty sadness like the ocean, it's a bitter sadness. It's a bitter sort of anger, it's a bitter sort of feeling that his feelings weren't reciprocated. And the ocean is an extended metaphor throughout the entire poem for love, and as we'll see later, the ocean too is bitter. Also, going back to the idea of rising up, he's letting go of his burden which is his love but it's also his earthly joy he doesn't feel tethered to this earth anymore and we can see later again carried on the waves have that continuous motion he carries the ideas throughout the poem and we'll see later that he doesn't really feel connected to the world anymore he wants to drown in that very ocean of love so notice how he said rising up and letting go it's I, I don't want to say ironic, but it feels ironic that he wants to let go, he continuously says that he's letting go, but he doesn't actually let go. He is so confident that he's letting go, he's performing this out for her, but he doesn't. Notice also the image that the wind is filled with sand and foam. So we came here for love, for uh, for that ocean depth, for an infinite love that runs really deep. And all we got was the surface level stuff, the mild acknowledgement, sometimes not even acknowledgement because she doesn't care. We got this foam and we got this little scattering of sand as memories from the beach and nothing else there is no wind that is filmed with warmth that was successful and that carries love this is it this is just sand and foam ultimately disappointing because it's not the real thing it's not the real ocean we also have hypophora another example of literary devices he asks us what qu what help is here and he answers straight away the question with there is no help let us go home and hence she will not weep we gave love many dreams and days to keep flowers without scent and fruits that would not grow saying if thou wilt thrust in thy sickle and reap all is reaped now no grass is left to mow and we that sold though all we fell on sleep she would not weep in stanza three we continue with the conflict and the poet before expressed his desire to go seaward but now he just 
feels the fatigue, it drags him down and instead he's just like, let's go home. He realizes how tired he is and he's tired because his dreams, dreams that are supposed to be the state of relaxation or something that demonstrates something really peculiar and magical and fantastic, something you don't really see in life, his dreams of love, his dreams that he gave to love, all his moments that he could have been enjoying himself doing something he can't do in real life were a disappointment, they fall through. He has a limited number of days, of course, being mortal and going back to that idea of drowning himself later on and yet he has given those days to love and love keeps them, love will not give them back love will not reciprocate his feelings once again and dream of course is a bitter word even with all that woozy and sweet hazy quality of ooh maybe she will love me at the end dream this is all ultimately a dream because she does not respond flowers never bloom sweetly and he never tastes the fruits of his love meaning his efforts never brought anything really forward as in he planted the seeds this metaphor of giving her love but she never reciprocated now all is reaped she has cut down everything no grass is left no room to plant new things and she does not weep she does not care all of this has gone to waste because this is ultimately not her effort and you might notice if you look a little bit deeper there there are quite a few occasions of sexual imagery here and the male and the female organs are reversed because she is the one with the sickle, she's the one reaping all of his seeds of love and ultimately this reversal leaves him weak and not himself because he is no longer like the man as was associated in Victorian society. He is left weak, he's left with nothing. Let us go hence and rest, she will not love, she shall not hear us if we sing here off, nor see love's ways, how sore they are and steep. Come hence, let be, lie still, it is enough. Enough. Love is a barren sea, bitter and deep, and though she saw all heaven in flower above, she would not love. So the sexual disappointment is continued further in the stanza, she will not love, all his dreams are once again unfulfilled. We see a repetition that she does not hear us sing, and she does not see the bitterness and cruelty of the world. The speaker uses the imperative of let us be, lie still, and finally we have this ocean, this love, and yet it's barren, just like his tears, it's bitter. And all of this contrasts with the previous idea of rising up, not only in terms of religious context, as in, well, people believe that if you commit suicide, you don't go to heaven, so he thinks that this is it. Instead of being rising up, he's going deep down into the love, but this love is not sweet, it's barren. So even though he has finally achieved his love, it is his death. And the line about heaven is, though she saw the possibilities of happiness, she still refuses to love him. And there's a lot of explosive B sounds and D sounds and dental D sounds and everything that emphasize the harshness of it all. And I think as part of your personal response, you could comment on whether you think it's possible to make someone love you as the speaker is trying to do. He constantly uses these verbs like give and sing. He gives all of himself to her and he wants her to know how much of an effort he puts. He wants her to feel sort of guilty that he's doing all of this for her and she's not reciprocating and he also wants her to emphasize so all of this is a performance like i said before to meant to elicit a response from a person who is not hearing she's continuing to be very stoic which i think is because she's scared that the speaker will bother her every day i think we're all scared <laughs> maybe if there's someone who loves you and you don't love them back and they just keep coming back and coming back and they don't take no for an answer that's a bit concerning you know especially if it's something in real life and it's like harassment so they're knocking on your door and everything so she is refusing to go with his impassioned flow and instead of backing down though we know that at the end he does back down he's only raising the stakes he's literally threatening to kill himself we have a very sharp juxtaposition in their two characters of him being frantic and impassioned and her being this stoic and calm person who refuses to give him a chance so that he doesn't continue, so that he doesn't come away worse than he does. She doesn't want to lie and say she loves him even though she doesn't. And this constant negation, her saying no, and his constant efforts make him seem very foolish. Let us give up, go down, she will not care, though all the stars made gold of all the air, and the sea moving saw before it move, one moonflower making all the foam flowers fair. 
Though all those waves went over us and drove deep down the stifling lips and drowning hair, she would not care. So in this stanza now, he continues with that earlier idea of drowning. He carries out that threat. And I, I said before that he develops the ideas that he mentioned before as a sort of lulling motion, the waves just carrying forward towards the shore, his ultimate goal of love. But it also really reflects his volatility, that he's willing to try anything by this point, that he's prone to change, that he'll go one direction, that this one thought that he had randomly is now going to be taken seriously. And and there's a lot of beautiful imagery in the stanza. The stars are made of gold, so the stars are precious. And the moon flower and the waves, this paints a beautiful and almost romantic image. He wants to show her all of this. He urges her to come outside and to be with him. He wants her to engage with it, and he is also drawing her out, which makes all the more sharper. The stiffening lips, the image of him going cold, and the drowning hair as he disappears. He also points out that the one moonflower makes all the other flowers fair. She is the one that makes him want love. It is only her that he wants in his life. And uh, once again, we have a beautiful example that Swinburne knows what to do with the words. We have W and R and L sounds, the liquid alliteration that, of course, perfectly suits the motion of the C. And we also have the plosive P's and D's from before. Once again, highlighting his pain and further making it known that even in this calm and beautiful image he's drowning you're killing me he's saying this directly to her let us go hence go hence she will not see sing all once more together surely she she too remembering days and words that were will turn a little towards us sighing but we we are hence we are gone as though we had not been there nay and though all men seeing had pity on me she would not see in the first stanza in the sixth line we started with yeah and here we end with nay. It is ultimately a no. And the oppositions continue to be prominently featured. The duality of the him and her, of course, but also the sound of the singing and then the silence. This reflects that this is it. This is the end. He finally accepts it, or perhaps he drowns and he just lets it all go because this is it it is no longer let us go it is we are going this is it they are leaving this is his final desperate attempt to command her attention because this is it they are actually leaving and he uses the onomatopoeia of sighing it's insubstantial just like his ultimate goal of being with this woman and i think this particular stanza is even more so open to interpretations than the others were because you could see it in two different ways so one, you could see it as she turns around and they are gone. Or two, you could see it as she never turns around. And this is more wishful thinking on his part. But this is it. He decides to end it here. Enough is enough. And he goes home. And once again, we have the sibilance and the assonance. And this gives this whole thing a very dreamlike, hazy quality as the speaker continues to hope against all hope. We are gone. And they are gone without a trace because ultimately the goal was unsuccessful. Love is the price they have not received. Even though everyone pitied him and felt for him, she did not. All right, this concludes the video. Thank you so much for watching just three more videos left now on three more poems and we're done with the entirety of the CIE GCSE 2022 curriculum from Songs of Ourselves volume 2 part 4. I hope you enjoyed this series. Please do subscribe, it really means a lot and like this video and if you think it will help, please do spread it out to people you, you want to help. So yeah, thanks so much for watching and see you next week.